Hello everyone, my name is Zach Butler and I'm the Portfolio Director for the IoT World Series at Informatech. Thank you for joining me today as I discuss IoT in a changing economic environment with IoT World Today, the leading IoT digital community, and Omdia, Informatech's technology research powerhouse. Firstly, I hope you're well and safe at home and you're finding your own ways to remain positive through this unprecedented time. The IoT community will prosper again. I found it really encouraging to see the growing number of news stories about how IoT is not only helping manage the fight against this coronavirus, but also how IoT is uh, being used as a lever for millions of businesses to pivot to business, digital business models and adapt rapidly in our new world. This proves testament to the rigorous developments of our market over the last few years, but as well as the very short development cycles in the past weeks and months to develop these new ways of life. We stand with you and we're here to provide you with content accessible information through our combined IOC re IoT research, editorial and event teams that you'll be hearing from today. This week, we were due to be uh, hosting the seventh IoT World live in, in San Jose. I'm sure many of you listening were planning on attending. Uh, the show has been rescheduled for August the 10th through 13th, again in San Jose, but we decided to host this webinar for you now to share just a couple of the exciting speakers that were due to be on stage. We're also imminently due to announce two IoT World virtual events, the first on industrial IoT on May 7th and the second on IoT security on July 15th. So keep an eye out for those announcements and registration links. Before we begin, just a few words about today's webinar. Uh, you can ask questions in the Q&A section. If your webinar freezes due to the high volumes of people using the platform, uh, please do refresh your page using the F5 key. Uh, you can also find free reports to download and, ex and an exclusive $500 discount to attend the live IoT World show in the resources section. Please note that this presentation is being recorded and it will be available on demand. We'll be sharing it via email on our website and via our YouTube channel shortly. We will also be live tweeting the sessions throughout today's webinar. And if you'd like to get involved, and I encourage you to, uh, please hashtag IoT World uh, to join the conversations online. And we'll, we will be hosting a Q&A session after the presentations. So now it's time for me to introduce, introduce today's speakers. First up is Alexandra Rahak. Alexandra is practice head for Omdia's IoT team, leading Omdia's IoT coverage and thought leadership agenda. Today, Alexandra will be covering the latest research by Omdia, including the impact of COVID-19 on the IoT market. Then we'll be hearing from Alex West. As part of Omdia's manufacturing technology group, Alex tracks, the, Alex tracks the impacts of trans, transformative technologies on the industrial sector. He'll be sharing with you insight into the impact of the changing economy on industrial IoT. I'm delighted to have Lauren Horitz join us today. Lauren's a senior content director of IoT World Today. She has more than 20 years experience in technology reporting and digital media. Her roles have included managing editor of Cisco.com and a senior executive editor in business applications. Lauren will be exploring uh, IoT on the ground through this changing environment. And finally, we have Brian Bunce, uh, who will join us to talk about the cybersecurity threats and consequences of this pandemic, which I know are a huge concern for both businesses, consumers, and public sector alike. Since 2016, Brian has written about everything from cybersecurity to digitization of man the manufacturing sector. And previously, uh, Brian has held senior editorial roles at the medical device technology publications. So let's progress with the first presentation. Uh, Alexandra, uh, thanks very much for joining us today, and it's time to take to the virtual stage. Thank you very much, Zach, for the kind introduction. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Omdia and IoT World Today's webinar on IoT in a changing economic environment. For the next 10 minutes, I'm going to share some of our recent analysis on the IoT market and specifically address the early trends and impact we see emerging from the very challenging situation created due to the global spread of the coronavirus. To set the scene, let's first look at the overall trend of IoT market growth. What you see in the chart here is steady growth in IoT deployment. Uh, that's what we've seen to date, and that's what we expect going forward although there's going to be a flattening out and in some sectors a decline in IoT device shipments, which is what's being shown here in 2020 and 2021 as a result of, of what's going on in the world today. Uh, the chart here shows our forecast of internet connectable device shipments. So what you can see here is pre-COVID-19, we were expecting those shipments to reach 
5.4 billion devices in 2020 and grow to 9.7 billion by 2024. We are now in the early stages of revising these uh, down for 2020 and 2021, going sector by sector to reflect the changes we expect. In our view, for most sectors where IoT is being deployed, the COVID-19 impact will really be more one of delay rather than derailment. The likely slowdowns are mainly going to be due to demand side constraints. Those are likely to be very significant in 2021 uh, and 2020, of course, and that includes lower consumer spend on discretionary items, um, much lower enterprise spend as, as enterprises are, are losing access to capital and, and trying to serve cash in the short term, and especially big impact on some areas that can be postponed that are very capital intensive or where significant manpower is required to deploy IoT solutions. And that's also going to have some impact on underlying technologies. So, for example, we expect to see some slowdown in 5G network deployment and potentially in terms of timelines for standardization. So, just to give a few early views on impact in particular sectors, we'd expect about a 30% decline in smart home and home automation device shipments this year, uh, and, and about an 80% decline in digital signage and display due to cancellation of outdoor events like the Olympics. So, look out for some uh, revised figures on this from us over the next few weeks. But there are also some spots where IoT opportunities are likely to see a boost, as we'll come on to in a few minutes. If we look at the top IoT applications that are being deployed right now, uh, this is helpful just to, to level set, really. Uh, we're looking at areas where IoT will be seeing the most impact here based on a survey that Omdia conducted together with IoT World Today uh, in Q1 in which we were looking at intentions and initiatives relating to IoT, 5G, and AI. It was completed prior to the significant spread of COVID-19, but what you see here is, is what the key applications are that companies expect to be deploying over the two-year period that we're looking at ahead. Asset monitoring, tracking, and management, very popular, but what you see below that is some things that are going to start rising up this list as a result of the virus, and that includes fleet management, that includes digital health, um, that includes anything really that drives automation generally and supports business continuity. And some things will be coming further down the list, and that includes things like smart metering and smart grid management, for example, um, and some industrial IoT applications. So we are expecting to see some shift in terms of what's really being uh, deployed that's of interest for our customers and, and a much closer look on the part of enterprises at what's going to be relevant for them in terms of IoT and really have short-term impact. If we think about what applications and what use cases for IoT are really going to see significant uh, positive impact, uh, looking ahead, we, we've uh, put our heads together and looked at what's going on out in the market. Uh, first of all, connected clinical devices and telehealth, so remote patient monitoring, uh, I think we've all seen a lot of very interesting and very effective examples of things like remote thermometers, um, much more complex kinds of connected clinical devices that are in much higher demand, uh, unfortunately, at the moment than they would normally be. Um, so that is driving interest uh, in that area and deployment in that area. Things like wearables and fitness trackers also, as individuals are taking responsibility for manage, managing and monitoring their own health, measuring temperature, et cetera, and, and often sharing that data. Uh, drones and um, AGVs, basically we're seeing a lot of interest in using those for different kinds of applications. I'll come on to in a minute. Um, so a lot of very creative ways of using drones uh, going on at the moment. Uh, we're also seeing a shift away from cash payments and different ways of shopping, a lot, a lot more uh, online shopping, a lot less uh, being out obviously in the retail environment. That's driving additional demand for wireless plus terminals um, and for retail automation as well. A lot of interest in biometrics as well, especially touchless technology for access and security and flexible manufacturing. So we're seeing some amazing examples of this already from companies like Tesla, um, as well as more sort of traditional manufacturers, very quickly shifting production lines to be able to manufacture medical equipment, for example, or masks in a very short amount of time. And that will really start to prove the value of that type of agility for the future. Um, at the same time, we see some areas with much lower demand. So as mentioned, because of reduced consumer spend, automotive sales uh, are dropping significantly, leading to lower production. That will lead to lower take-up of connected car services. 
uh, reduced demand for consumer smart home appliances, digital signage as mentioned, smart metering uh, will be significantly lower this year because of very limited manpower available and lockdowns and so on to, to deploy that. Extractive industries like oil and gas, uh, obviously seeing a huge hit uh, those markets at, at the moment and that will have knock on effect on IoT in those, in those industries. And then industrial automation in the short term, uh, we do expect to see a significant pause in that area. So if we look at some specific examples of where IoT devices are, are being used in, in some pretty amazing ways uh, to, to battle the COVID-19 virus, uh, just a few examples here, there are many out there, uh, but really I have to say some of these are, are quite inspirational, very, very um, creative, often reusing technologies that, that are you know, originally designed for something else. Generally, the, the objective here is public health protection, and we see some examples including the, the Kinsa connected thermometer, uh, apologies for the typo there, 2 million users uh, for that connected thermometer in the U.S., uh, generating I think about 150,000 temperature readings per day, and the data from those is helping to predict where virus outbreak hotspots will occur. We're seeing smart helmets being deployed in China, uh, a company called Guangxi, which is manufacturing uh, what they're calling AI-enabled smart helmets that's for public security and public health monitoring teams. They, they have infrared temperature sensors to help scan clouds for individuals who might show higher temperatures and, and be potential COVID-19 carriers. At the picture on the left, uh, you see some very cool autonomous vehicles from a company also in China called Neolix, uh, who just raised $29 billion, million, not billion, sorry, to produce uh, these mini robo-vans that are being used both for deliveries, which was what they were originally intended for, and for spraying public areas with disinfectants. And then drones, as I mentioned, lots of, lots of uh, ways those are being used at the moment in many different countries and settings. That includes for public health announcements, movements, monitoring, temperature monitoring, and spraying disinfectants as well. So a lot of, lot of innovation at the moment, uh, obviously driven by a very terrible situation uh, but it's really showing uh, the power of IoT to help address some of the, uh, you know, the most difficult challenges that this is presenting us. So just to wrap up before I hand over to my colleague Alex, a few recommendations uh, for how IoT providers and enterprises can address the current COVID-19 environment. Uh, if you're a technology provider, you know, certainly be aware your customers are facing a major shock. Uh, be ready for that, be ready for a big slowdown and also shifts in their priorities uh, very quickly over the coming months. Delays in CapEx heavy IoT projects, so you know, definitely important to, to think about that in terms of planning. Uh, definitely get creative about how you can reuse existing IoT solutions and technologies to solve COVID-19 challenges. I, I expect we'll continue to see a lot of examples of that going forward. Uh, we do recommend considering offering free access to some IoT services and solutions. Uh, that can be helpful in the short term. Uh, Sigfox, for example, has just announced they're offering free connectivity to companies developing a solution to help address the virus. Uh, it's a powerful way to, to demonstrate value. And keep in mind that you know, we will be at an, an end to this, or at least an upswing coming out of it uh, at some point, hopefully in the not too distant future. And businesses will need a lot of support um, for resilience in terms of getting back online and uh, addressing new market opportunities. If you're an enterprise or public sector uh, entity, really consider how you can use IoT and connected solutions to meet some of your immediate challenges. Uh, consider open approaches to, to data sharing from connected devices. Again, we're seeing some really powerful examples of that, obviously within regulatory and privacy guidelines, very important to keep those in mind. But we really um, have a, you know, a, a very positive attitude towards that, and I think uh, we'll really see the power of shared data going forward. A lot of um, instances starting of state-funded uh, support starting to become available for companies to invest for the future, invest in innovation as, as they go forward and come out of this uh, virus situation. And do work with your suppliers. Uh, you know, I think there, there's an opportunity for a lot more flexibility on payment models, business models, and uh, you know, outcome-led uh, types of engagements. So with that, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Alex Blest, who is going to talk to us about industrial IoT in the changing environment. So Alex, over to you. Thank you very much, Alexandra. And uh, thank you everyone for joining. I hope everyone is, is safe and well. Um, as Alexandra mentioned in her presentation, the 
in the industrial space, there, there's certainly an area where, where there is a, a challenge. And so one of the metrics that we measure as an indicator of the industry's health is production of machinery, which is a good indicator for investment in the discrete industries. And here we're, we're forecasting a 15% contraction in 2020. So certainly within the industrial space, as a, as a result of this pandemic, there is a, a change in economic conditions, and it's not exclusive to the discrete industries. We also see this in some of the process industries, as an example, in the oil and gas industry. Some of the supers there have announced reductions in capex between 20 and 30 percent over 2020. So certainly the industry is, is facing challenges, the industrial environment, and as is often the case in these types of situations, this can change the landscape somewhat in terms of who are the leading players, competitive capabilities. And we look at digital transformation technologies as a way of helping some companies differentiate, helping them to be flexible in these particularly difficult times, and also as the market recovers, enabling companies that are invested to bounce back more quickly. And so really the question goes to who wins in the new normal. And we did an analysis looking at the readiness of different types of companies in the industrial space in terms of their ability to implement these types of digital transformation projects. And here we saw that Asia was uh, the clear leader in, in this space in terms of its ability to introduce IoT solutions. This was followed by Europe and lagging was the Americas. And really we see the Asia's le Asian lead there primarily um, led by obviously China, Japan, South Korea, uh, some of the regions that are heavily investing here. But also, particularly in some of these regions, there's been significant investment in greenfield. And so this means that a lot of the facilities are relatively future-proof and are able to invest in, in or introduce these new IT, IoT technologies more quickly. This is also supported by government initiatives. So as an example in China, the Made in China 2025 initiative has really been a strong driver in terms of the introduction of some of these new technologies into the industrial space um, supported by government schemes. And so we, we say that really to highlight that as we come out of these, these globally difficult times, there is the potential for some shift in terms of where the strengths will lie. And digital transformation projects, the ability to be flexible, to move quickly, to react, to improve efficiencies is going to be critical in helping companies remain competitive in these challenging times and as the opportunities come back online. And the reality is that industrial IoT can support on these sorts of projects across a range of opportunities and applications across the life cycle of production. Now, Alexandra mentioned predictive maintenance, and certainly in the industrial space, there is traditionally a strong focus on how to reduce unplanned downtime. That's really some of the low-hanging fruit we see where probably the largest, or the largest portion of these types of applications are being introduced. But certainly in light of what's happening with COVID-19, we see two elements becoming particularly increasing in focus. One of those is the supply chain. At the moment, there have been a lot of challenges around um, supply chains breaking down, uh, inability to have that visibility of delivery of solutions and products. And we see companies as they introduce greater connectivity in terms of not just within their own organization, but across their partner organizations, their suppliers, this is going to create a more interconnected supply chain, a more robust and more visible supply chain, enable companies to handle some of these challenges and identify bottlenecks more early on. Uh, an example already we see is on average, we see that companies that have introduced IoT solutions have been able to reduce inventory costs by about a fifth. Now that's one example, but another example is in terms of how workers are going to work in the future. And I'm presuming that most of the people on this call today are working remotely, working from home. And obviously, the technologies that we've already seen introduced in the enterprise environment, in the IT environment, supporting remote working, these are starting to filter through into the industrial space. 
Companies are looking at how they can support greater remote working uh, by monitoring equipment remotely. So remote monitoring solutions, even remote maintenance solutions. In some of the process industries, we've seen centralization of control and expertise so that uh, key operators can be removed from on-site locations and at greater risk have a, a more dangerous environment and able to be placed in, in a more secure or safe environment. And so really we see around changes in IoT applications, there will be a big focus increasingly next year as the market recovers around the greater and more robust supply chain and looking at how to improve labor efficiency, but certainly in light with capabilities of remote operation. And we already see this in some industries. The oil and gas industry is certainly strongly looking at how they can demand oil rigs as one example. But one of the areas that we also see is, is, is a challenge, and I mentioned this earlier around the cut in CapEx in the process industries, is in 2020, CapEx will be limited now. That's a reality that uh, many companies are going to face, but also an opportunity for some companies that have already invested. That ability to shift with these IoT projects to enable a change in the business model, so moving from product focus to selling of services, uh, moving to an OPEX, an ongoing budget. And that, that's going to be uh, a strong enabler to help some companies that are going to shift. Now, we, we see that already taking place in the consumer industry. We see this with Netflix. Fortnite is a computer game that's absolutely free to download. It's the largest grossing computer game over a billion dollars and they make their money in in-game purchases. Well, those models are starting to transfer into the industrial space. As one example, there is a company that produces water purification equipment. Now, rather than selling the purification equipment itself, they've moved to a model where they are charging some of their customers for the amount of gallons or the number of gallons of water that have been purified. So really shifting from selling product to selling an outcome. And this is an area where we see a lot of uh, interest. We were speaking to one of the large oil companies uh, last week, and, and they mentioned the same thing around automation. They were saying, look, we don't want to be responsible for the automation and the operations. We want to outsource that. If we could pay uh, a, a fee, an ongoing fee, uh, even an outcome-based model where we pay for operational, uh, for, for operational uptime, then that's something that they would certainly be very eager to do. So really when we, we talk about industrial IoT, we see this business model transformation as one of the, probably the more significant transformations, even beyond some of the basic applications. It's how do we use new business models to enable introduction of these technologies and, and companies to develop and improve. Now in terms of where the market is today, the majority of the industry is still not at that point of running projects. So we see over half of all companies not yet endeavoured on a, an IoT project. Even when they have, um, those that are tri trialling and on that POC phase, they have generally seen like less than 50% of projects have failed. Now that's fine at a POC and, and, and almost that's good. You want to be agile when tri trialling these digital projects to find out where can I apply these projects, where are they going to work for my business and where not. The bigger challenge really comes around deployment. Now, we found that almost half of all companies that deployed industrial IoT projects did not see the expected value. Now, I'm going to touch on a couple of the reasons I closed, but one of the reasons also is around expectations. We found that a quarter of all companies deploying IoT projects expected payback within uh, six months, and over, within a year, half of all companies expected a payback. Now, that's very aggressive targets, and that can also be influenced by who's leading these projects. We found that the IT teams often were more aggressive in terms of their expectations of payback. But just as I wrap up, three key challenges that need to be traversed. Uh, in, in no particular order, one of these is legacy equipment. So within the manufacturing space, often there are machines in place with an average lifetime of 15 years, so some going well over 20, 30 years. In the process side, similarly, we have control systems sitting on in power plants and in oil rigs that are 30 years old. These have not been designed for connectivity 
which is really the fundamental starting point of IoT. A line to that is collecting data. Even once the connectivity is there, how is the data stored it is one of the big challenges. But also, even when data is stored, how do you actually get meaning? How do you move from having a lot of data to it really influencing the making processes that you have? And that's key to really unlocking value around IoT. But we would say that the single critical factor is that of people. This is not a technology issue as much as a people issue, both from the perspective of getting people to trust the technology that they're using, but also in terms of getting them confident to the fact that this is not going to be a replacement to their job security and ultimately something that they should not have a vested interest in investing. And so here are some of the things that pe people need to consider when looking at deploying IoT projects. And with that, I would like to hand over to my colleague, Lauren. Over to you, Lauren. Many thanks, Alex. And thanks to you all for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And I'm going to take a little bit of a different vantage point. I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of industries based on my discussion with experts and practitioners. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about healthcare and telehealth and what's happening there. And then I'm going to talk about supply chain management. And that may echo some of the things that you've heard already. So first, let's just uh, talk about some key takeaways for you guys. And I, I think the one, the one thing that I really want to emphasize is that these industries were really at a tipping point prior to the emergence of COVID-19, and we're now likely going to see this change accelerate out of necessity. And these changes really involve digitization of process and greater incorporation of data-driven decision-making by IoT and big data analytics. Now, there are some caveats here, as my colleagues have noted. Digitization may take a short or even a medium-term hit in light of the economic downturn. According to some projections, world GDP may decline in Q2 by as much as 24%. And just for a little perspective, compare that with uh, the worst quarter of the housing crisis in late 2008 in the U.S., where the economy shrank by about 8.4%. And then there's also the human element. Digitization is happening in these industries, but at the same time, practitioners and users are really just trying to catch up and, and adapt to some of these changes in technology. And public policy is also going to need to adapt as well. So now just to level set a little bit, I want to talk about what we mean by telehealth. Uh, today, what most people are talking about is really digital communications, video conferencing, between a practitioner and a patient. But increasingly over the next couple of years, I think what we're going to see is that telehealth is also going to involve digital diagnostics remotely. So a patient being able to use an IoT-enabled device to gather uh, patient health metrics such as temperature, heart rate, lung function, and then have those patients transmit those metrics via a HIPAA-compliant platform. And that's already happening today. Okay, so now let's talk about some of the benefits. And again, these benefits were already um, being demonstrated previously, but they've really been put into high relief by this healthcare crisis. So the first is reduced cost associated with in-person visits. Uh, one survey prior to 2020 reported a 50% reduction in ER visits and actually a 90% reduction in hospitalization. Broadening access for patients is another one, and this is particularly applicable for rural residents uh, who have to cra travel great distances, but also for the elderly or the very sick. A third is this contribution of patient data to large data sets, which helps practitioners track and, and do predictive analysis for conditions like cancer and diabetes, but also today with illnesses like COVID-19. And telehealth is also prompting this creation of early warning sign tools. Alexandra alluded to this when she talked about smart thermometers being able to identify virus hotspots and also the impact of, of social distancing doing that in real time. And just to kind of sum up uh, the overnight success of telehealth, Cleveland Clinic expects to have uh, more than 60,000 telehealth visits in March Compare that with 3,400 in the previous period. That's about a 
100% increase. Now, there are some obstacles uh, in the move toward telehealth that could slow progress. I won't go through all of them, but I'll just mention a couple. One is licensing in the US. Uh, practitioners are licensed per state. And uh, during this current crisis, the federal government has suspended these requirements. But ultimately, policy is going to have to kind of take a look at how to address licensing for remote care. Another is reimbursement. Uh, in the US, as of December 2019, only 10 states provided parity or equal reimbursement for telehealth sessions vis-a-vis in-person ones. And data security and privacy. Hackers have actually targeted video conferencing platforms over the past couple of, couple of months for malicious activity. And this is an obvious compromise uh, for patient data. And then lack of broadband access in rural areas. Only about two thirds of rural re residents have broadband access, so that could be a problem. And there are others, but we won't uh, dwell here. This slide um, is really just to uh, demonstrate the power of telehealth over the past couple of months. It's really exploded overnight, and practitioners are, are saying themselves, we're at a point of no return in a good way, and we really can't go back. And the US Federal Commission, uh, Communications Commission has agreed and recently announced a $200 million COVID-19 telehealth plan. So now let's talk a little bit about supply chain management. And this graph is really just to demonstrate what I think you probably already have witnessed as consumers and stores lately. Um, you could see that sharp drop off between December 2019 and March of 2020, where we're now at US output levels below 2013. And just to put a finer point on this, um, that's because today China has such a major role in, in the economy as a whole. Uh, today, its percent of GDP is 16%. Compare that with about 4% during the SARS epidemic in 2002. Okay, so now let's, let's talk a little bit about what experts and customers have been saying in, in the wake of this. So just um, as one more stat, uh, electronics manufacturers anticipate about four weeks of supply chain delay, and that's really in stark contrast to what we've come to expect as consumers in having this sort of two-day or less delivery. And set that against the backdrop of a historic lack of advanced data capability. Others have mentioned this. Um, in a study that was done prior to 2020, about 60% of manufacturers said that they had poor visibility into who they were doing business with, their tier one suppliers, their direct suppliers, but also their tier two and tier three suppliers, that is their supplier suppliers. And about 50% also said they were doing uh, procurement functions in Excel, which has uh, sort of limited predictive capabilities. So what are manufacturers doing in the, in the short term? They're uh, taking some pretty drastic measures and, and they're trying to get a handle on inventory and demand. Uh, and they're doing it with some data, but they're also doing it through some manual uh, means, stand up meetings daily, calling suppliers on a regular basis. And as a result, they're trying to adapt their sourcing strategies, minimize their risk. They're doing some product redesign to accommodate those new sourcing strategies. And they're also doing some product rationalization and customer prioritization. They're saying, well, we, we may have made 50 uh, colors in previous years, but this year we're gonna make three. Or we may have to kind of look at our customer base and uh, identify some high priority customers. Now, long term, what does this mean? Uh, according to many of the companies we heard from and, and experts, one of the, the critical things that they want to do is invest in, in technologies for greater insight, data insight. Uh, so that means investment in control tower technology to get better vi visibility into inventory risk and demand. And companies are really beginning to see this as a must have, not a nice to have. They're also considering new connected products. Some have emerged to help supply chains establish KPIs for key metrics uh, using AI and ML and, and to kind of help them predictively look at scenarios and take recommended next steps based on these algorithms. 
Another thing they've talked quite a bit about is continued investment in cybersecurity. Brian will go into this in greater detail, but you know, the headline here is that malicious actors exploit turmoil and chaos, and uh, companies are sort of uh, looking to brace themselves for that. And then the last is really about data transparency and a sort of mentality shift. Uh, there's a possibility that uh, companies will start to really think about how to use uh, centralized data and shared data among suppliers and manufacturers, potentially even using blockchain. They're talking a little bit about that. And they're also really talking about moving from sort of a zero sum game mentality where they they are trying to uh, work with one supplier to help one customer to really a, a more of a data sharing and uh, a collaborative approach where they're trying to help many customers, not at the expense of uh, one customer, one supplier. So in sum, um, digitization will happen based on necessity in these industries. How much and when will hinge on economic uncertainty and some of the other factors we've all discussed. And we really look forward to continuing to uh, evaluate these industries as we go forward on IoT World today as the situation unfolds. And I will now turn it over to Brian. Thanks, Lauren. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today. I'm Brian Bunce, Content Director of IoT World Today. I wanted to share some thoughts on the cybersecurity consequences of the coronavirus pandemic. So in this presentation, I'm going to make the argument that COVID-19 could be the first time that a biologically infectious virus has a, a big impact on the, the cyber landscape. So we all know about malware viruses, but um, it's already having a significant impact on a number of different types of workers, um, governments, uh, medical establishments, et cetera. So you, you could argue that there's been a long history of malicious hackers, um, adversaries targeting or referencing epidemics, pandemics, and their threats and their malware. And that is indeed correct. So to kind of go into some context there, the first um, case that I know about goes back to 1989 when you have somebody who is actually an AIDS researcher himself launching an AIDS-themed um, attack against a number of researchers. I think he had 20,000 floppy disks he mailed out to some people like in, across 90 countries pretty grand scheme, but also kind of shows how rudimentary like this kind of scheme was back in the late 80s. He asked for a payment be sent after the computers locked up after maybe like two weeks after people installed the software, be sent via a cashier's check to a PO box in Panama. Um, you fast forward to 2003, we have cases of malware authors that are exploiting SARS in more modern type of tax. Um, bird flu, H5N1, 2005, swine flu and Ebola, 2009, 14, respectively. We have MERS and Zika figuring into attacks in 2015 and 16. So there is a substantial history of people using pandemics, epidemics, and attacks or referencing such pandemics or epidemics um, going back for some time. Um, already, though, we have uh, ransomware, phishing, other attacks that are exploiting COVID-19. Um, so one thing that's different with coronavirus, COVID-19, is as um, some of the present presenters <laughs> alluded to, is that this could be the global the biggest global disruption since the Second World War. So you have a growing amount of fear among the, the business population. You have the UN saying that COVID-19 could lead to enhanced instability, unrest, conflict. Uh, you already have a number of adversaries taking um, advantage of people's fears, people's willingness to click on phishing campaigns that may have coronavirus mentioned in them, download software, et cetera. So I think the healthcare industry faces a potential perfect storm. So you have this huge uptick in demand for resources, like shown here is an image from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation that shows in the United States a potential uptick in demand for here hospital beds, um, other equipment like respirators later in the month. Um, so I, I'm putting this in the neutral column because it's probably too early to know if it's positive or negative, but in the middle of March, several ransom op ransomware operators had a press release they sent out saying, we're not going to attack hospitals. So I think it's too early to know if we can trust them on that yet, but I think it is worth paying attention to. There's other groups such as Ryuk, another ransomware um, operator that's made no such promise, so likely they will continue to target uh, medical establishments. 
And we have a precedent of ransomware in the past, even before COVID-19, knocking offline connected medical devices, knocking offline, in some cases, entire hospitals. So um, that could potentially happen as we go forward. To kind of summarize the, the medical threat landscape, so connected medical devices themselves are often difficult to update because if you have an update that causes a problem, it can potentially um, harm somebody's life or potentially do worse. Um, hospitals are more likely to pay ransoms than other types of organizations. There is already a case last month of malware shutting down temporarily a hospital in the Czech Republic that was offering COVID-19 testing. Uh, many hospitals use unsecured or minimally secured, I should say, legacy workstations. So even if those machines are offline, they could potentially be compromised by somebody who takes advantage of the chaos to put in like a USB stick, or it's just kind of more of the same thing where people are, are overwhelmed and there's more risk of things going awry. We already have documented cases of cyber criminals targeting the Department of Health and Human Services in the United States, and the World Health Organization, and a range of medical organizations. Another wrinkle to how COVID-19 is affecting cybersecurity is this kind of collision course between corporate and home networks. So that's been happening for some time now, but it's obviously had a significant uptick just in the past month or so. And I think perhaps people, when they hear about that risk, they, they imagine that it's possible for a threat actor to listen in to a smart speaker or to listen in or watch via connected video cameras. I think that is possible, but there's not a lot of documented evidence of wide-scale campaigns that um, target that vector. There is more evidence in, of people that are targeting unsecured medical devices for DDoS campaigns. Just recently, there was a leak of data from Russia's security service, FSB, that indicated that that still was an ongoing priority to target unsecured, I think even like digital video recorders, um, cameras and things like that to be able to launch DDoS attacks. And then there was a recent and unsuccessful attack, I might add, on the World Health Organization that even though it was unsuccessful, it points to the sophistication of the threat actor who is willing to go to great lengths to kind of replicate somebody's um, native digital environment in their attack. Actually, um, WHO at us all this morning has seen a two-fold increase in attacks against them since COVID-19 has happened. I thought that was an interesting point of reference. Um, going back to the whole theme of the collision of remote and uh, remote working environments and corporate environments, I have a quote from Alexander Poniewierski, global IoT leader at EY. He says, many employees are creating command centers in their home environment with minimal security protections. And again, minimal because Oftentimes, companies are kind of rushing to scale up infrastructure and to expand their remote working capability without thoroughly vetting security as they do so. To kind of add some color here, so these data points are early, so take them with a, a grain of salt, but we have three pieces of data in the top and the bottom left from the IoT search engine Shodan that shows a 41% plus increase in remote desktop protocol. So that's used to remotely access and control workstations, window computers. And what's interesting there is it actually went down for part of last year before ticking back up again because of security threats, the fact that RDP was used for some ransomware attacks. We also see VPN use ticking up dramatically in some cases, such as Italy, is perhaps increased as much as 100%. And then I had in there a, a factoid about U.S. peak internet traffic has increased by roughly a third, in some cities roughly twice that much. Then in the lower left, there's a, an image showing the increase 16.4% in industrial control systems, a smaller increase than the others, but potentially more dangerous. So as I explained in this slide, so industrial and critical infrastructure sectors could be in danger because you have this kind of expansion of remote accessibility you have an outsized cyber risk. If you have somebody who's able to manipulate industrial controls, you could have accidents, you could have pretty dramatic outcomes. You have, in some cases, industrial facilities scaling down to skeleton crews. You have aging equipment that already was a, play, already a problem and budget shortfalls. So to kind of wrap up here, so this is a bit like saying, don't forget to take your medicine, but don't forget about secure by, secure by design principles. So build in security early on into your projects, early on when you're trying to scale up 
any kind of remote working infrastructure, any kind of new connected um, technology, don't forget about security at the outset. Involve security folks early on in discussions. Don't forget to involve them. And then also, don't also forget about traditional concepts such as defense in depth, which basically recommends having multi layers, multiple layers of security protections. And then plan for worst case scenarios. So I recommend in here tabletop exercises. So basically imagining what would happen if our organization got attacked by a particular type of attack? How would we respond? And then you can use that information to, um, to lock down your, your organization in the long run. And then finally, also remember network availability challenges. So I think people are often think about the potential to have information be leaked or things that interfere with confidentiality. But one um, particular outcome is you could have organizations that have cloud connectivity that's interfered with. You could have things that um, interfere with their ability to manage workflows. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention today, and I will um, transition to the next phase of the webinar. Great. Thanks, Brian, and thanks to all of our presenters. There were some fantastic, quick, short, sharp presentations on the, the uh, situation across our market. Um, before we get to Q&A, just a quick reminder that you will be hearing from 400 experts at this year's IoT World in San Jose in August. Um, we'll have representatives, uh, everyone on this webinar will be joining, as, um, along with other representatives across the enterprise and solutions ecosystem. Uh, as an attendee of today's webinar, uh, you're entitled to a $500 discount in your attendance, uh, which you can access via the resources tab with a VIP code of IoT Live. Um, now, it's time, now it's time for question and answer. Um, this is your chance to share queries and comments directly with us uh, and the speakers. Um, we've had quite a few questions in already that's, that's been submitted, so thanks very much for that. Um, if others come to mind, um, please feel free to ask them via the Q&A widget or on social media um, as we continue and we'll try and funnel them through. Um, so just to kick off, and Brian, to, to start with you, where we've, where we've, uh, where we've finished, um, just a question about uh, what the cybersecurity community is doing to address the challenges that are being posed by, by the coronavirus. Um, is there any information you can share there? Thanks, Zach. So you have a lot of vendors already that are kind of factoring COVID-19 into their offerings or they're offering to help companies um, get their priorities straight as they kind of move into this rapid response mode. I think one of the most interesting things I've seen in that regard is in healthcare. There is something of a, a global cybersecurity league where you have some pretty, um, pretty seasoned people who are good at defending against cyber attacks. So they call themselves the COVID-19 CTI League, so that's a cyber threat intelligence group, and they have collaborators across the globe. So I, I think that's kind of a, a way that they can potentially protect against attacks on hospitals, medical establishments, et cetera. So I think that's perhaps the, the best example I can think of, but there is a pretty dramatic shift in um, messaging from cyber vendors as well. Okay, thanks. And uh, Alex, just to throw out to you, is there any further comments around, particularly around the industrial market? Um, Brian was talking about industrial control systems. Um, any further in, insight there? Yeah, we, we certainly see cybersecurity as a, a big challenge. Um, so we, we did a study on this recently and found that over half of industrial companies had a, had a cyber cyber breach in the last three years. So. I think often it's a case of people will try to ignore it when it's not happening to them. Much like we've seen with the coronavirus, we've seen a lot of people until they have been affected by family members still not socially distancing. There's a similar parallel in the industrial space where there has been a time where people have sort of focused really on the cost over the, the threat to the business. Um, at the same time, there was also on the industrial space a big challenge around what is the cost of a cyber threat versus the cost of potentially um, stopping operations for a period of time to introduce, you know, more robust networks, uh, other cyber security technologies. So this is also a challenge that a lot of the industrial companies, more so on the process space, are also sort of having to battle with. Great. Thanks, Alex. Um, one question that's uh, come in that I'll, I'll ask. I'll ask you guys, but uh, 
I think the answer is going to be uh, we have to keep we have to keep an eye on the uh, on the market. Um, but one question, and Lauren, I'll come to you for this: is how long do we think it's going to take for the supply chain to to get back to normal as a result of the crisis? Yeah, so that's uh, one of the million dollar questions I think uh, that we're all sort of waiting and watching for. I think certainly in the next uh, six months, we're going to see a lot of uh, substantial disruption. And then, of course, it really depends on how the virus uh, continues to play out, how much uh, physical distancing has an impact. But, you know, I think we could be looking at, you know, sort of 12 to 18 months of uh, uh, potential disruption. Um, I think it, it. I think over the next six to twelve, we'll see things calm down substantially. But you know, we could be looking at at a longer period of time where we continue to see disruptions. Thanks, Lauren. Anyone else on the panel want to chip in for that one? Any your opinions? Um, just a very quick thought on my side. This is Alex. So, I think we mentioned early on and a few. The presentation issue of a, a new normal um, that goes back to the question of any changes in the competitive landscape, companies having to address or identify new vendors, um, potentially also the issue of reshoring as well, whether that becomes a bigger area of focus. So, maybe not answers to the question. I think you know, these things take a while to adapt and change, they're not going to change overnight. But, but these are a couple of considerations that would be more, uh, should be born in mind. Okay, thanks very much, Alex. Um, there's, there's and maybe just, sorry, that... maybe just one, one point to add to that. It's, it's also looking okay. at the complexity of the supply chain. So if you think of an automotive OEM where there's multiple tiers, um, that's a far more challenging supply chain to, to quickly change. So sorry for the interruption. No problem. Thanks, Alex. Um, there's there's been lots of uh, questions that have come in about uh, specific IoT verticals and also a number of the horizontals. So I'll, I'll try and group them together. The one that seems to be most uh, common that people are talking about is the impact of uh, on smart cities and smart city deployments. Um, whether it's focusing around um, public safety um, and the uh, and the impacts that our emergency services are, are having. At the moment, but also to flip that into a positive side, how is how is the deployment of, of IoT devices and, and advanced connectivity and private networks helping helping these markets? Um, Alex, I'll, Alexandra, I'll come to you. Um, if uh, as I know you haven't answered one yet, so any any uh, any insight you want to share there? Sure. Um, so I think it definitely is going to have impact in the smart cities market, I, I think in a couple of ways, and probably the best way to think about this is, you know, short term, medium term, long term. Uh, in the short term, you know, what we're seeing obviously is a, a huge change in the way that that people live and move in, in cities generally. And, you know, that that movement being quite restricted, uh, entry into say retail shops uh, being quite, uh, quite restricted. Uh, the need to measure temperatures and crowd movements and so on. So a lot of things that we have had the technology for, but that you know really haven't been widely deployed in smart cities, um, in, in cities in general in those countries are now having to be deployed very, very quickly in a lot of cases. So that's, I think, putting a lot of pressure on, on city authorities, on city governments, um, as well as you know lar larger state authorities to, to get those solutions in place quickly and also to make sure that uh, you know that they're getting the population on side with using some of those technologies and, and being comfortable with you know say seeing a drone flying overhead uh, making public health announcements or spraying disinfectant on, on the street or whatever it happens to be um, so a lot of things that might have taken longer um, under normal circumstances to come into play into smart, in smart cities are, are you know happening right now um, in the, the medium term, you know, the challenge for smart cities is what it has been and, and will continue to be, which is finding funding for deployment of, you know, of smart city technologies in, you know, in the wider sense. And, you know, obviously that's not just things about monitoring or, you know, public health, but it, it's, you know, things around uh, smart traffic management and, um, you know, public, uh, you know, public lighting and all those sorts of things. So. A lot of it will depend for the medium term on where federal and, and city funding comes in and on public-private partnerships 
uh, to to kind of take forward some of these um, to, some of these use cases that haven't been quite so um, so quick to see take up in in the smart city. Uh, but I think you know a lot of opportunity certainly as we see 5G continuing to roll out, even though that is going to be slow. We would have expected, um, you know, we'll we'll see, you know, again, sort of a wave of innovation and experimentation and, and investment in solutions that use that, but it's just in those cases can come later than it would have done as cities are having to focus resources on, on much more immediate issues. Sure. Can I jump so in with, there as with, well? Sure, Lauren. Oh, sorry. Were you going to say something else or can I jump in? I, d I just no, wanted to ahead, share please, a couple um, thoughts. Okay, just a couple additional thoughts. Um, one is the $2 trillion stimulus package that passed recently in the US. Um, and there is a substantial portion of funding that goes to states and local governments. Um, and in, so I think it's about 340 billion. So some of that may uh, trickle down into areas that, that are significant for smart cities. Um, and, and the two additional things that I would say that um, I think uh, coincide with some of the things that Alexandra said were that, um, you know, in my discussions with a couple of smart city folks, both a consultant and an IT leader, uh, what they have found is, is a real slowdown in the, or halt completely of IoT projects in the short term, um, where the attention really is being focused right now is on digital services, on um, uh, digital communications, really. And I think that presents an interesting uh, picture for the midterm for 5G build out. Um, we're also seeing some funding being applied for 5G. Um, so there, there may be a mixed picture here for, for um, some services and we'll, and we'll have to watch it. Well, thanks, Lauren. Um, one, I was just gonna follow up on the 5G um, comment that you made, Alexandra, about, uh, you mentioned that the, obviously the, um, the scenarios where 5G deployments were going to be tested, so things like the Olympics, that, that, that say, are obviously being pushed back. So, do you, are your, are your anticipation that the, the development of the market is still maintaining, or do you see extensions in in rollout of 5G because of the scenario? Yeah, so we have seen commitment, um, certainly in some markets, to keep 5G rollout going at a, you know, at, at the pace that was planned. Um, I don't think that will be the case in all markets. Um, you know, we've certainly seen. Uh, statements to that effect from some of the operators in the U.S., uh, from some of the operators in China. Um, but I would say in, in most markets, we are going to see some delay in, in rollout and, and a subsequent delay in, in coverage. And then, yeah, as you rightly say, back some of the um, sort of more more public major um, use cases for 5G, for example, supporting um, you know events like the Olympics are also being delayed. Um, so I think that doesn't mean that it, it won't come. I do think it will be delayed. Uh, it's also worth saying that, you know, the first wave of 5G and what drives that will really be around consumer um, communications and consumer technology. So the, the IoT wave of 5G, if you want to think about that, was in any case um, something we were looking to happen more from 2023 on. So, you know, in terms of the standardization of the elements of, of 5G, they need to support a lot of areas of IoT, uh, for example, UILLC. You know, that that is coming in in later releases of the standard that are are still uh, being agreed, and obviously there's going to be um, you know some likely delays to that standardization process as well. Um, so again, I think delay, not derailment. Um, I don't think we're talking about three years of delay. I think we're talking about you know depending on the market, uh, six to eighteen months of, of delay. Okay, thanks, Alexandra. And uh, just a, a couple of um, points on the smart city questions. There's been a few comments that talking about um, kind of that this has been going on for a long time and the length of deployment for uh, for public sector um, and also a number of different enterprise industries that are adopting IoT and questioning about whether you know this is going to change that. I think my personal opinion and some things that we're all seeing in the market is that you know companies that are uh, the companies that are riding this wave best are ones that are already doing things around the digital transformation and the companies that are really, you know, really struggling and, and are having that light bulb moment now are the ones that have been the slow adopter. So if, if as a market we're talking about, you know, post-hype scenario moving into more of a steady growth, um, we're certainly seeing that this is, this is um, really sped up the um, the uh, the awareness of how IoT is, is impacting, uh, impacting uh, companies and industries. Um, so just a final point there on cities. Um, 
Next question uh, is, was actually a question about the inter interrelation between uh, IoT and AI. Um, does anyone want to chip in and, and share any thoughts about how the uh, the coronavirus situation is kind of is changing the rates of adoption for for IoT and AI related and machine learning related solutions? I mean, I, I can jump in for just an initial comment. You know, I, I think if you look at some of the uses of, of data in particular around, um, you know, both looking at, at how you can aggregate data uh, from, from patients or from the general population or indeed from, from smart thermometers to, to get a, a better view on, um, you know, on trends and, and to use that to feed into uh, development of, you know, cure prevention, prediction of where things are happening, you know, all, all of those use cases involve some level of, of AI. So I, I think anything related to the use of population and, and healthcare data and so on is definitely, um, you know, seeing a boost from AI. And then, you know, as, as the market develops, the, those learnings will feed back into, into what's going on. Um, you know, I think for some other areas, adoption is definitely, um, you know, still very early stage. Um, you know, it's, we're, we're far from the point where we have kind of AI and everything, but, um, you know, we're certainly seeing things like the use of um, AR and VR in, in those connected police helmets, for example, and, you know, the use of that data, again, being being pulled in to do things like facial recognition and so on. Um, so that that's another um, area where it is playing in. Uh, obviously, you have concerns about privacy there as, as well, and you know, more or less tolerance of, of the, that use of AI in, in different societies. Oh, thanks, Alexander. I could join in there, and um, this is this is this is yeah. Brian. So I think you, you could see potentially a, a surge in AI automation in some sectors, at least, and, and some others like oil and gas that have been that have been hard hit. You're probably not going to see that in the short term. But I think data from groups like the Brookings Institution have highlighted that in previous financial crises, you see an uptick in automation. And I think a lot of a lot of what is thrown under the rubric of AI these days has some kind of element of triggering automatic or automated decision-making ability. And I think it's likely that you would see an uptick in that, at least maybe in the, the medium term, and maybe to some extent in the short term as organizations scramble to kind of redefine processes as workers can't uh, work in the same way. Cool. Thanks, Brian. Um, one final question, which I found particularly interesting. So thanks very much for this, the listener. Um, it's a question to open up. I think, Alex, I'll come to you because I think it's most related to your market. But the question is, what's the motivation for buyers of hardware to shift to buying services? And how do you think this situation might change that, that thinking versus kind of build versus buy? Yeah, uh, I think that's a great question. It's a question that um, lots of companies are asking, but I mean, really, as we touched on earlier, the COVID-19 issue is causing a lot of challenges in the market, and, and especially on CapEx. You know, people don't have money for big upfront investments, so they are looking at ways to, to spread that investment over an, an ongoing process, so looking at an OPEX-based model. So that's where that idea of servitization can um, certainly bring some benefit. Um, in terms of, you know, should they do it? Is it going to be build versus buy? Well, a lot of the industrial companies, they want to focus on their core business. They don't want to focus on sort of operational uptime and, and maintenance. You know, these are often things that they outsource to a third-party service company anyway. So they want to focus on their core business. So, you know, this would really be an extension of that. If equipment manufacturers are collecting that data, taking greater ownership of service, I think that helps companies to focus on their core business. And in terms of who does it and who doesn't, I think you know some companies will try and build it in-house. They want to keep their IP. Um, they feel they can build build it based on the skill sets they have. Um, but this can be a challenge. You know, we're, we're dealing with a lot of new technology, especially when you start thinking of AI and these uh, some of the things that Brian mentioned around cyber security. This requires a lot of expertise, and there's a shortfall in the industry of this expertise. You know, people are struggling to find data scientists, they're struggling to find cybersecurity specialists. So all of these things can make it very difficult for, you know, really building a robust in-house solution. 
Great. Thanks very much, Alex. Um, thanks so much uh, for the panellists. Uh, that's all we've got time for today. So thank you for the speakers for your presentations and the Q&A session. Um, and thanks for everyone for tuning in. Um, don't forget to take advantage of your exclusive webinar discount for tickets for Internet of Things World in August. Um, if you'd like any more information on IoT, um, we've got a range of reports that are free and available to you now, and they're accessible to you via the resources section and the widget bar. Um, there was a lot of questions about whether this recording is going to be posted online, and yes, it will. Um, we'll be releasing it on demand with the slides and audio shortly. Um, the widgets that the, the widget the resources that you can access uh, include things like IoT 5.0, preparing for the next phase of IoT, um, expanding the connected vehicles landscape and how IoT sits at the intersection of transformative technology. Um, and there's more ebooks, reports, videos from our 2019 IoT World keynotes that will be uh, that will be released on our IoT World IoT on demand page on the IoT World website. Um, so on behalf of all of us at the IoT World series, so thank you very much for joining in. Uh, we look forward to you joining us in our upcoming webinars and virtual events and hopefully soon at live events as well. Um, please share the words if you think they're useful to join, uh, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, please stay home, and we'll see you soon. Thanks very much.